Right, so we are now recording, so good evening to everyone. And uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to actually not be doing the introducing uh, this evening. I'm only introducing uh, Georgia, who is Georgia Christea, who is the new events coordinator. So hopefully you'll see Georgia there. And um, just two or three words of introduction, because um, Georgia needs honouring as the person who actually invented the concept of the tag talk, so um, which was then put into effect. And here we are now. And we've, I think it's been a, a great success, um, everyone, at least everyone tells me. And, um, you know, it's part really now of, of what TAG does. So um, Georgia had the effrontery to suggest that after only a few years in the UK, if I understand it correctly, uh, from Romania, educated in um, the architecture programme in Bucharest, and then came to do a master's at the Bartlett in conservation. So um, Georgia will correct me, it's around 2010 or 2012? 12. I finished 12. in 12, yes. Right. And then by 2017 had joined TAG. And otherwise, um, Georgia uh, does uh, great things. It's a guardian of the uh, of SPAB, Society for the Protection of Ancient Monuments, and does an awful lot of work sustaining, encouraging craft and everything related to uh, good workmanship and so on. So uh, it's great to have uh, Georgia on board. And then I should say that we haven't got Victoria um, present. This Victoria is now um, TAG's administrative assistant and helps out with Georgia uh, in programming th these events and such like. But Victoria had a baby, I think, only about two weeks ago. So it's quite understandable that she's not with us tonight, but I'm sure she's with us in spirit. So with that, I'll hand over to Georgia, who is then going to introduce our the speaker, Lucian Style, who yes. is um, much adored by many people. And so, uh, Georgia, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you for your presentation. Very kind of you to come to introduce me. So I would like to tell you a few words about Lucian Steilnau. He's an author, educator, and architect dedicated to the design and building of healthy, durable, and beautiful places and buildings in a world of many and diverse inspiring traditions and cultures. He believes traditional cities and architecture have always been the ideal of harmony of within the destabilized, disrupted world that we are living in. For him, traditional cities and architecture have remained desirable models of cultural identity, home, urbanity, and civilization. And because now we are in the holiday season and most of our usual public is out of town in holidays or others in traditional architectural summer school, I would like to invite you, the present audience, in a different type of a journey, a rather introspective one, an immersion into the wonderful world of the Lucian, practically in the space where the moon is always full a place of beauty and harmony, of collective aspiration, a place from elsewhere and nowhere, a place of meditation, memory, but most of all a place of hope, the hope of change, the hope and confidence in the power of traditional architecture and urbanism as organic and sustainable tools in creating a better city the hope that tradition can be truly a good home for modernity and originality, a perfectly fit for 21st century. On that note, I would like to hand over to Lucien to let him guide us in his poetical and hypnotical world of his architectural capricci. Lucien, to you now. We don't hear you very well. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. Do you hear me? Excellent. Hello. I hear you now. You can. I. I would like to hear you even better. Okay. All right. So, uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'm very glad. I'm very honored to speak uh, to you, to you, dear tech members, friends, and colleagues. 
It is a delight, honor, and privilege to present my architectural capriccio lecture tonight to such a distinguished audience. I wish I could have done it live in London with the book signing event, but Providence has had other plans, and here I am in the virtual world sharing my southern images. The other good news, good and bad news is that the first edition of my book, Travel Sketches from Elsewhere and Nowhere, is almost exhausted. After less than one year, a revised second edition is in it works. And the picture you have on the on this page is uh, beginning of a capriccio is the beginning of a journey. So every of my capriccio is a journey, and it's a journey which, a journey like uh, the situation is, is a journey without a map. You know, I'm traveling to places I don't know where I will arrive, and it's uh, very much unplanned. It's very serendipitous, and it's very much based on discovery. And as Georgia said, it's an inner discovery, so discovery of myself and the discovery of places and people. So it's a, I'm kind of kind of really open. Okay, so I'm trying to move on and it was actually okay. I'm trying to move on and it's kind of blocked. So I'm sorry for that. I don't know why. Do you hear me? Do you still hear me? Yes, I hear you. Can you I move on? Yeah, the, so I'm trying to move on my picture, but it doesn't seem to move, so I don't know for what reason. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. So the architectural okay. capriccio, do you see? Do you hear me? Do you see the picture? The architectural capriccio. I hear and, you very well, and I see the first slide, yes. Okay, so I kind of slightly changed the title. So I, my book title is elsewhere, nowhere, and I kind of added somewhere. So somewhere, elsewhere, and nowhere. The Capriccio fosters both memory and imagination. Paul Bowles writes, imagination is but an other form of memory. And we know that every memory is a reconstruction. We can experience past events only from the present, and the present changes our perception, memory, and vision of both past and future. As much as the reconstruction of past and future changes our present. Remembering means reimagining. So these are my, I have uh, this little Moleskin sketchbooks of all different sizes, mostly smaller ones, so the largest size I've been working is like an A3, very rarely A2 or A1. And I keep some in my pockets and I take some everywhere, but I never draw from the places. I draw from the memory of places once I'm no longer in the place. The Capriccio allows exploring our voluntary and involuntary memory our consciousness and subconsciousness in a relaxed and detached way, like meditation where we are invited not to think, but to go beyond thinking. It operates indeed as a poetic catalyst encompassing a better way of building and dwelling. It aspires towards an architecture culture of excellence and integrity, fostering beauty, durability, and comfort. The architectural capriccio is not an antidote to the death of architecture as an essential cultural, artistic, and political endeavor, but it can be considered as a meditative and nyomnyomic act of resistance and reconstruction dedicated to recover and restore the fundamental creative and poetic principles of architectural imagination, theory, and praxis. So, uh, the capriccio you see here, it's uh, an imaginary place which looks familiar and it probably exists somewhere or it should exist somewhere. And it's painted with coffee. I did the same one also with uh, watercolor. This is from my book, uh, some, uh, some of my quick sketches, some uh, capriccio sketches, I kind of gave some different um, 
variations with different tools. So I'm also experimenting. So I'm experimenting with form, experimenting with places, but I'm also experimenting with tools. So I'm kind of trying coffee, wax, um, watercolor, color pencil, and mostly mixed media on often very simple paper. So either square paper or what they use in Italy for in uh, for table mats. It's like what they call catapalia. It's uh, straw paper, which the donkeys like to eat. This is a, one of my larger, a little bit larger. It's, it's an A3, so the folded, the, the double pages makes a uh, little bit larger than an A3 format. Uh, ideal city, if you like. And so every time I travel, I add something. So I was kind of, this was done after I came back from Japan. And I was so inspired by the Monte Fuji. So I'm having two Monte Fuji kind of rem memories in this one. But then generally, the architecture is kind of draws from many, many cultures. It mixes different cultures, but it's always focused on public realm, on the civic space. It has ornament, it has sculptures, it has fountains, so it never has people. And some people wonder why it never has people. And I'm not really concerned about it because when people look at my capriccio, they always ask, they always, they never ask me where the people. They always tell me, I like to live in this building. I like to live on this floor. I would like to inhabit this tower. So they never are concerned because so the cities are empty, they seem inhabited, or at least they seem to be willing to receive inhabitants and life. So they kind of express life without necessarily having people uh, in, the, in the drawing. Looking at some Wikipedia definitions, so uh, a lively piece of music, typically one that is short and free in form, a painting or the work of art representing a fantasy or a mixture of real and imaginary features. In painting, a capriccio means especially an architectural fantasy placing together buildings, archaeological remains, and other architectural elements in fiction and often fantastical combinations, perhaps with their fashion figures. I'm giving several of these uh, definitions that you see here a more kind of stereotypical or cliche um, representation where you have like some iconic archaeological buildings or monuments from Italy kind of put together in a colorful tourist advertisement, or it could be cover from a popular music LP with Italian music. Etymologically, two origins have been proposed for the word capriccio, whose existence dates perhaps to the 17th century. One derives it from the Italian word for goat, capra, and suggests that animals' arbitrary or willful behavior, goat-like, in other words. The second combines the Italian word for head, capo, with riccio, or head shock, evoking a person with the hair standing on ends as shocking and surprising. But the capriccio is not punk art, it's not provocative, it plays around, it's playful, and you see I myself experimented with the spikes and this kind of French type of shoes, and I did this as an homage to one of my modernist colleagues in Luxembourg. But it also shows that in some way, even this type of unusual and maybe unclassical architecture could become, could be in some way processed to make a real place and a place which is a desirable place. Another one, another example of a really quick sketch I did in the restaurant on this table mats and then he kind of processed it and developed it and colored it at home later. And again, it's an, maybe not a traditional type of food, but it's kind of feels like it could become and it could be a place, a very desirable place. The architectural capriccio encompasses playfulness and the joy of doing and creating and, a play, and of play, playing, obviously. And playing, you know, that playing is learning. And so, you know, we have now some colleagues who have grandchildren and babies, and they will understand very quickly that the only way you learn is by playing. And then the playfulness goes out, learning becomes a really weary and uh, pretty unhappy system. It does not reject 
experimentation, collage, bricolage, fun and divertimento. The architectural capriccio acknowledges the creative process as a joyful and nurturing experience. Its capriciousness is a serious matter and acknowledges the difference and respect towards artistical achievements of all periods and cultures. And I would say, including the modern movement, including Bauhaus. Its lightness and playfulness are not ironical or polemical, but genuinely generous and kind. Its experimentality and its open-mindedness expresses sincere and unbiased commitments towards beautifully well-crafted and memorable artifacts, both classical and vernacular, public and private, discreet and sublime, minute and monumental. Its tolerance towards surprise and serendipity acknowledges curiosity as the origin of learning and knowledge. The architectural capriccio does not oppose concepts like originality, creativity, nor eccentricity without making it the main purpose or reason of being. So it is not concerned with orthodoxy. It does not celebrate heterodoxy and provocativeness as a source of inspiration. Here, a wonderful capriccio by my former student, Stephanie Hasmines. It's a Los Angeles capriccio, and you see buildings by uh, Geary and by other famous modern architects, and uh, it creates a really very compelling atmosphere, and it's kind of very expressionistic and colorful and enchanting. Palladio, an uh, ideal city built only with Palladio's buildings. And I'm, uh, I apologize for the bad quality of the painting. This is a painting by Carl Robin. And you see that architectural capriccio explores the poetic nature of architectural invention, so the inventio, the design project, as well as the form of the architectural object itself. So the topology, morphology, the massing, color, color palette, materials, um, meaning, and so on. Another definition of the capriccio is a pictorial invention, creating an imaginary or analog reality by combining existing buildings or places with imaginary ones or non-existing ones, shifting or reorganizing their locations and groupings into uniquely suggestive visions. In fact, what characterizes the capriccio is artistical truth, reality as a becoming and not as a fatality, poetical realism and wonder. It enhances a formidable potential of life and livability in beautifully composed, complex and memorable environments, places, landscapes, and buildings which only exist in the realm of desire. The realm of the desire is the realm of life. And uh, Capriccio by its uh, Leon Cries, uh, Villa Plinius, I think. And it's an, uh, I think a quick painting, like, uh, like a draft, which really shows in, in color, in composition, in some way this uh, ideality, this kind of des this desire transcending uh, the capriccio. Another one, which is an, uh, a wonderful digital painting by Gil Gorski, is also a Plinius Villa, with the same kind of intensity of desire and of uh, dream and uh, I would say magical realism. Uh, Leon Cuyer's Atlantis, an ideal city, which leads me to the Renaissance, um, formidable and famous ideal city. The ideal city is a capriccio. It celebrates the values of citizenship and the common good. And the perfection of architecture stands as a metaphor for good government. The mathematical perspective system developed in Florence by Brunelleschi is both analogous to the order and the beauty of the universe and that of the city. Just to just to mention, just, just to say that the capriccio is not, it's 
interested in lightness in playfulness but it's not a, it's not light in ter in terms of metaphysics or in terms of content it has it's kind of an ambitious endeavor uh, which has looseness stylistically or uh, architecturally and pictorially but it has a lot of kind of serious and sorrow and deep philosophical content which kind of passes through the imagery. Again, Atlantis, uh, the ideal city of art in Tenerife by Leon Cuyer. On the right side, you see um, a project by Aldo Rossi, which I think is very, very important um, in the context of the analog city, also a type of an ideal city. And I also like to show Rossi because he really uses the capriccio systematically. I think almost all of his friendings using the technique of the capriccio, so the composing, collaging, uh, layering, uh, and um, you know, to suggest, so rather than the realistic uh, computer graphics, which kind of pretends to show what the buildings will look like really, and so it never looks like this imagery shows where this more suggestive poetical imagery give you kind of a better feeling of what it would be. Which leads me to the Chitta Analoga, which is, I think, in some way, an, a, last, a last attempt to save the modern movement in a kind of new form of ideal city. And this year is the 50th anniversary of the 1973 Triennale of Milan, which was directed by Aldo Rossi. It was a spectacular and impactful event, highlighting Aldo Rossi's discourse on rational architecture, typology, morphology, and the relevance of the traditional European city. I think that it's really the beginning of the movements which leads to new traditional architecture and new classicism. It was a legendary and convivial gathering of the most talented and influential architects, modernists, postmodernists, romantics, and proto classicists working together, as you can see in this painting by Arduino Cantafora, whom I met recently, is a fantastic, wonderful person, uh, where you see buildings by Adolf Loos, by uh, Aldo Rossi, by, uh, uh, you, see the, uh, you see the Pantheon, and you see uh, other historical buildings, and you see uh, buildings of all styles uh, coming together to make a real place, to make a real city. And Aldo Rossi, here you see this symmetry of Modena, which has been built, and uh, you see the, this wonderful, his wonderful renderings. And Aldo Rossi writes the geographical transposition of the monuments within the painting, I will show you the painting afterwards constitutes a city that we recognize, even so it is a place of purely architectural reference. So in some ways it's a place we recognize, but we don't remember it, and it's a, it's a fiction. This example enabled me to demonstrate how a logical formal operation could be translated into a design method, and then into a hypothesis for a theory of architectural design. That's the painting Aldo Rossi is talking about this famous Palladian Capriccio by Canaletto, where you see uh, the Basilica by Andrea Palladio and a bit of the Palazzo Chiricati, which are in uh, Vicenza. And you see the project in the middle, you see the project of the, uh, the Rialto Bridge, which was a competition entry which was not realized. So these buildings from different places or unbuilt, built, come together and create a place which is so intense, so believable, so real, so strong, that even today people go to Venice and try to find this place to take a photo of it. And so here, just for you, record the wonderful Basilica in Vicenza and the spectacular and absolutely unique Palazzo Chiricati in Vicenza. And then this magnificent competition entry, 
but Palladio. Absolutely beautiful and enchanting. And that's the very enchanting reality in Venice. I've been there quite recently. It's a fantastic place to be. And actually, I think that uh, my I've I've been in Venice several times, and I think it's one of my it's one of the places I think I I feel at home very much, and I think my capricci take a lot of inspiration subconsciously from Venice. The urban capriccio consists of a complex and elegant assemblage of buildings, monuments, fabric, and places, creating an intense sense of familiarity and surprise. People recognize it, so they don't remember it. And they are surprised because it matches their memories of real places and of dreams and desires. It proposes integrated newness, freshness, and originality, fostering both convention and invention. So on the left side, you see one of my sketchbook entries, black and white. And as I mentioned before, so I have here, I have two shores. So it's a kind of island, an island stretch. On both sides, there's water, and you have the mountains as a background. And you have references to uh, Roman Romanesque architecture, to um, mostly vernacular classicism, but also references to industrial. So you have big chimneys, which I always um, excuse by saying they, there's a uh, heating and ventilation system for the for the community. On the right side is an homage to seaside. It's a kind of installation or it's a capriccio celebrating uh, the 30th anniversary of seaside with a Torre Tempietto, a lighthouse, a sculpture, the three muses or the beach girls, if you like. The Cracker Cabin, which is a very local Florida vernacular and the boathouse. And I'm borrowing uh, the figures on the right side, the figures are from Leon Crius, that is uh, legendary and mythical um, figures from Leon Crius. Here, as a urban capriccio from a workshop I run in Chiang Mai in Thailand with students from the Shuala Longkorn University from Bangkok. So it's, uh, I gave them one of my capricci and asked them to kind of adapt them to Thailand. So they kind of transformed my uh, draft into with gives them a local flair. And this was an, a one afternoon exercise. And my own capriccio with many towers uh, inspired by Siena, San Gimignano, and many, many mountains and uh, water. And always, I would say, the full moon. I have the full moon almost in every of my capriccios so that when I don't have the full moon, it's very easy to give the capriccio name then the capriccio will be called a capriccio without full moon. The architectural capriccio has been used also as an imaginary poetical museum many times by many people. So this is a this famous painting capriccio by Joseph Michael Gandhi, uh, showing a selection of public and private buildings with the works of Sir John Stone. And it's a magnificent, so you see, Capriccios, so many of these buildings are capriccios themselves, and the room, the interior becomes a capriccio. So it's a kind of layering of, of meanings and content, which is really, really fascinating. The same here with Leon Cries, oeuvre complete, built and unbuilt, and the master Leon in the middle, very happy with his work. On the right side, you see obviously uh, Tomperi, which I think is also. The capriccio, the, the Queen Mesa Square, with um, um, with the design Leon Leon Chris design, but uh, the input by many famous uh, British architects like Queen Terry, Francis Terry, and other remarkable contemporary architects. And here uh, another uh, museum with the work of Ali Reza Sagachi. Also a collection that you see a big work plans and this kind of interior with a view on the outside where you see 
uh, Leo Krius work. And so you see, uh, I think this is uh, the Leon Krius um, Atlantis. So interesting clin d'oeil uh, ref ref reference or difference to a master, Maya master. Many of the most beautiful buildings and places are inspired by many other beautiful buildings and places. All beautiful buildings and places built and imagined contribute to the technical, poetical, and artistical culture of architecture. They become a part of the world contributing to architecture as an organic component of both culture and nature, and forming the traditional repertoire to copy from, to imitate from, or to take inspiration from. Like this building by Ludwig Persius and August Stüler, Belvedere, Pfingstberg, Potsdam, which is obviously composed of many, many elements from other buildings. And like Bill Westfall eloquently quoted, buildings are made of buildings. <clears throat> and here, another example, this wonderful Italian village, I don't know the architect, but uh, also buildings made of buildings, composing a wonderful built capriccio and here a very intense and compressed one. The La Scartuola in Italy, again. But also places which are maybe more ordinary, like a villa in, the, in Como or the Garda Lake or somewhere in the English countryside or a castle. So the invention of architecture and urban places, both built and unbuilt, follow the imitative logics, the compositional choreography, the proportional harmonics, the mnemonic strategies and the poetics of the culture. I like this word, uh, but I have a hard time. Uh, I have a hard time spelling it, but it it means referring to memory. I like it so much. Uh, I have to train my tongue a little bit. But there are also accidental capriccio or serendipity, where suddenly the intrusion of a new building completely starts changing the reading and the understanding at the meaning of the place. So this is in in uh, in Cachan which is the southern banlieue of Paris, and is a railway bridge, huge. And it looks like an antique viaduct. It's a main, and it's a 19th century. So it's a 19th century building in stone, and it cuts just through the city. And it works as a powerful architecture and urban catalyst and transforms a relatively ordinary Parisian suburb into an intriguing capriccio articulating poetically sky and earth, city and architecture, and the fragmented suburban landscape. Actually, it holds together something which was in some way relatively ordinary and meaningless. Suddenly, it becomes like an, it comes unified. It becomes something meaningful. Would you recognize it without the monumental viaduct? If you take away the viaduct or this bridge, it would just look like any other beautiful suburb in Paris, but you wouldn't recognize it. Now, everybody can recognize it. This is Cachan. Archaeological Capriccio, in some way, is the genre which we are, we, when we talk about Capriccio, and when you have exhibition with Capriccio, it's mostly this type of Capriccio, which is a collection of uh, archaeological buildings, ruins, or reconstructions, or intact antique buildings which are kind of mixed together in a kind of wonderful setting. And I think my endeavor in some way tries to transcend a little bit this limited understanding of the capriccio, so acknowledging it as an important inspiration. Like you can see here in Pompeii, on the right side, you see an archaeological reconstruction, which had to fill in the gaps, archaeological gaps, with imaginative, speculative, capriccio-like elements. But on the left side is a real drawing taken, a real capriccio taken from a mural in Pompeii. And so you see the, the kind of references. And there, so there's a kind of, so the right Type capriccio is 19th century work of an archaeologist or an architect, and you see 
the thousands of years of difference and the kind of similarity of you know imagination and feeling and, and poetry. The city itself can be considered a capriccio with its fantastic layering of time plays inventions, its compositional originality, and its surprising collages and juxtapositions, and I would say accidents and transformations at urban and architectural scales. Many buildings form also an architectural capriccio within the city as an urban capriccio. So you have buildings which are so complex and layered and made of other buildings sitting in a urban context which is itself a capriccio. The antique ruins became powerful and inspiring catalysts for architectural erudition, creativity, and imagination. Most places in cultural history are built on the ruins of preceding places. Both classicists and romantics cherish ruins, drawing knowledge, inspiration, and emotion from them. They love the ruins as beautiful fragments, but above all because of the beauty these fragments encompass as revealed or suggested by the exquisite restoration or reconstruction endeavors of grand tour artists and architects, scholars, and historians. So there's one pleasure with the ruin, the love of ruins, but there's an even greater pleasure by imagining what, where the ruins come from, how the buildings look like, and you can see this in the Envoi de Rome by the Beaux-Arts architects where they draw very meticulously the ruins and they render them. And then they kind of submit various reconstruction strategies which are rendered as eloquently and as magnificently. The Forum Romano built and rich over centuries, encompassing the res publica as an organic and living spatial, architecture, economic, social, political, religious, and ceremonial organism with complex layers of places, monuments, and events, as well as memories and myths. And this is an architectural construction. You see how intense and how much this kind of really reminds us of the archaeological Capricci. And again, a museum Capricci with all the antique buildings of Rome assembled in a single room. So the room becomes a Capriccio. And you have paintings which show the buildings, and you have like figures and sculpture features. So you have a, a layering of uh, scales and forms and tools and mediums to show. Uh, and you have even a kind of a, another time, a window, like in Ali Sagarchi's uh, Capriccio, you have another window into the out, outside. And again, another one. So this was by Giovanni Paolo Panini, who was one of the masters of the architecture Capricci. And another one where you see this um, magnificent monumental Capriccio with um, broken buildings and intact buildings, often, often the Pantheon, obviously. And of course, the Villa Adriana. The Villa Adriana was a capriccio from the very beginning because it was supposed to figure, to configure, and to show in an eternalized, built form the various travel memories and desires and dreams and imaginations of the Emperor Hadrian. And this magical, this magical and uh, and this inspirational quality remains deeply embedded even in the ruins. Now here's an example where the intrusion of a singular building, which refers to classic antiquity, a little pavilion which refers to classic antiquity completely changes the way we look at Edinburgh, 18th century or 17th century Edinburgh, because it kind of composes, it starts, like I mentioned before, uh, you know, when you look at um, time, the present and the past, how the present starts influencing our rereading and our reconstruction of the past. So the meaning kind of evolves and the city imagery so it's 
not changing dramatically. There's a kind of flaring, so with an evolution and an enrichment mean. And another one where you have another uh, metaphysical capriccio where again you have this strong present, this obsessive presence of antique elements, but on the side, you know, and you have the perspective, the infinite, the water, nature, and some people are going so uh, kind of narrative and very poetical, interesting narrative. Now, the Grand Tour was a fantastic adventure, and it's, I think it was so essential to the quality of the architecture we have seen in the past and to the culture, the classical culture was so much dependent on this very um, elevated tourism, this elevated and very refined and uh, serious and thorough tourism where people went with their sketchbooks and their measure tools and did beautiful drawings and beautiful, wrote beautiful poetry and had their, and their journals. It was an essential part of the education of architects until the Bauhaus. I'm not blaming the Bauhaus particularly, but I think the Bauhaus is like this kind of key moment. So many of the Bauhaus architects did, their, did the Grand Tour. They actually had an expanded Grand Tour. Many of the Bauhaus people went to North Africa. They went to Greece. So they went to places the um, Renaissance or 17th century architects couldn't go or were not willing to go. Uh, but it was, the Bauhaus kind of was a kind of change, it was a shift uh, and subsequent learning, I think, particular post-war, when the, the Beaux-Arts tradition was rejected and the ped ped pedagogical paradigm, classicism were rejected. So the idea that everything has to be invented, that there was no learning from the past, that history was not taught anymore. And in some way, a limiting, eliminating imagination under the pretext of freeing imagination by taking away the dominant examples, the dominant inferences from classicism, they kind of killed the education killed the idea of intuition, imagination, experimentation even. The Grand Tour not only encompassed a thorough study of antique buildings and archaeological sites, but also encouraged highly speculative and idealist reconstruction projects of antique cities, landscapes, and monuments. And very, I was very impressed when I read that often the painters and architects, they went to places and they did some sketches, but then they went home to their studio and then they kind of started really drawing and designing away from the place they visited. So there, there is this kind of moment, there's this distance between when you sit in front of the monument, you sit in front of the landscape, and then when you're in studio and kind of you're processing your memories and you kind of start really getting to the final design. Capriccio has been used by many artists of the Grand Tour as it allowed to complement the real by additional layers of super real, including intuition, memory, speculation, imagination, invention, offering such a much larger palette to fully illustrate the complexity and architectural richness of places visited documented, recorded, or merely reimagined and eventually corrected, redesigned, and reinvented. Wonderful drawings by Lucan, which looks so different from the sketches from most of the tech members or from Notre Dame students, but it's so powerful and emotional and so I think what's so great with Lucan that he was not ashamed to do childish drawings or to, he didn't deny his inner child. And what's, the drawings are really, really very suggestive. They're very, very powerful. This is a drawing by a uh, watercolor by one of my students from Notre Dame. And it's a real place. It's a real place. And it's uh, and from a painting by Jules Frédéric de Villeneuve 
and you see like the collection of buildings. I, I mean, and if I, if I wasn't a humble person, I would say it could almost have been me. But I, I like the, I like the whole atmosphere, the whole character. This is uh, again um, a capriccio by from my student, from a student Stephanie Hasminas, where I ask, I ask the students to take a church from. Um, um, uh, from a, I don't remember the name now, but it's a famous church on the on the main commercial road, which and put it on an other location. Uh, the, the the Tiber River, the bridge. So in some way, what happens here? It's only the translocation of a single building and some recomposition of a whole Roman landscape, and it looks. Definitely Roman, and I did the same. So these are other of my students doing a similar exercise, working with existing buildings and relocating, compressing, changing, adding new elements. The presence of the past, the passionate and refined archaeological reconstruction and capricci of the Grand Tour artists do not consecrate the past of the past but its perpetual presence, its vitality and inspiration, and its contemporary universality. Whether antique ruins, sculptures, or perfectly reconstructed monuments and cities, the references to antique culture and classicism do acknowledge their relevance, resilience, inventive, artistic, pedagogical, and creative potentials. The references, references to antique cultures and classicism do acknowledge their resilience, actuality, and vitality rather than their death. Beautiful painting, uh, I would say, a capriccio by Giovanni Muzio, who was an, quite a an prominent architect of the 20, beginning of the 20th century for Milano. He has uh, buildings which you can still see in Milano. They are really very interesting. Uh, there's one building which is called the Ugly Building, and it's not ugly at all. It's kind of housing, mixed use, it's very, very interesting building, very urban, and meeting with Vitruvius. So this idea of encountering an encounter between a modern architect and um, one of the most famous figures and also of the only known treatise of classical architecture from antiquity. And so you see buildings which refer to Vitruvius career, and on the right side, it's uh, Muzio's buildings, mostly in Milan. But also in, uh, in the Chirico, the obsessive references to antique culture, and obviously magical realism, and, and then trans the transformative poetry also. And so here you have the Kiriko on again on the left side. So, so the metaphysical paintings, the Piazza d'Italia. On the right side, you have a Piazza d'Italia by Rita Wolf and a, from a project by Leon Freer. The, the architectural project. The Capriccio can be understood as a metaphor of the architectural mind and of the way it operates by association, analogy, permutation, and improvisation. It can also be the architecture project itself, which combines analysis and synthesis, precedent and experiment, technical and expertise and artistical poetry, fragmentship and virtuosity, convention and invention into a richly layered, intense and intricate image. As you can see here in this project by Pier Carlo Bontempi, Many, if not most of the most beautiful buildings and built ensembles have drawn their inspiration from other beautiful things built and built and mere imagined. And this project by Pier Carlo Bontempi, Piazza d'Italia in Val d'Europe, Paris, also embraces the oval shape from a Roman amphitheater and um, refers to the Italian tradition of vernacular and classical architecture. Also, Torre Bella Monica, a project in, in Rome by Leon Creer. This is a digital image, like Leon Creer now tends to have mostly digital images by Wani Man, which is an, 
amazing, quite uh, fascinating ensemble in Chiang Mai, which takes inspiration from um, from Bologna. It's very, very impressive how direct quotes from Bologna uh, are, trans are transferred into a Thai built environment and it looks like a Thai city so you can recognize everything which is borrowed or copied from Italy. Very interesting example of cultural appropriation, I would say, in the best set. This also are uh, examples from work in, is in Chiang Mai, also by students from the Chulalong Khan University. It's a quick uh, design sketch, uh, which is close to the previous project. And, and so I'd like to show also this project, which I did in collaboration with Victoria schultz who is now a young mother. And I really uh, like to express my compliments. Uh, this was from a competition, Sydney is Beautiful. And I just want to quickly show, so it it's an, uh, was an empty, pretty, ugly site built over an underground highway. And this is the, uh, the side of the site. And, and um, can you see my arrow? I don't know if you can see my arrow, but uh, okay. But the main building on the right side, you see there's an entrance on the, on the north side, there's an entrance into a tunnel of a highway which goes under the whole city of Sydney. So the building, so the tunnel has been there and the building kind of follows the, the line, the shape of the tunnel and creates, it's a musical, it's a building for music and dancing and the other buildings are kind of celebrating culture and creating and the buildings themselves, they kind of seem to dance. So here's the elevation, so it's a very, steep uh, roads and so you see uh, the dancing the ballerina sculpture and various buildings so there are markets uh, dance uh, artist housing mixed use all following enriching the city and dancing with the city if, if you like um i i like uh, to to say it a culture project in uh, Brussels. So this is the existing tower, Au Platon, which has been organized by La Table Ronde by Maurice Culot. And this is what I propose. So reorganize, redesign in the mode of a capriccio. So just kind of redigest without any destruction. So, which I think is really important to stress that you can improve places without destroying just by adding or refacing. So the tower is just the same tower, but it's just refaced. So what I do, I, I take out every second slab to have higher ceilings and then just kind of redesign the facade and create the top to the building. Another project uh, in the Capriccio modes, it's uh, Elephant Square in London. You are all familiar with the place. At this building, you see uh, in the middle is an, uh, a listed building, uh, I mean, highly listed building by a modern architect. And it's an intense traffic place. It has a straight geometry and it doesn't have really much personality. And so what I proposed uh, is to add a number of buildings, like a pergola, um, monuments and also kind of reface and trade the facade on the north of the side. And playing around, playing around with various concepts, like I like very much the concept of the chakra and acupuncture, where you just touch energy areas in the city and trust the self-healing regenerative forces of the city itself. So just by rather than kind of replanning or demolishing, reconstructing everything, kind of just adding, adding and creating substantial uh, poetical interventions which kind of encourage 
and allow the city to, to survive and to flourish. So you see that I don't touch the background, which is all modern, high rise and everything. And I think that even the strong gesture statement in the Capriccio allows to, allows to, in some way, create a better place. So finally, to come to my book, Service Sketches from Elsewhere and Nowhere, my Capricci feet of faces, which exist somewhere, elsewhere or nowhere, or have existed, and if not, they ought to exist, either in past times, present times, or future times. And I hope that sometime I will, that's what actually Clive Aslett writes in the, in the forward, and I hope, I hope that sometimes maybe I can build something like that. I have stopped making a difference between my drawings, my designs, and my build work. They are all embedded in a desire, and again, you see the notion of desire, the desire of building. So even if I do mostly drawings, all my drawings are embedded in a desire of building, a better world, and shaping a new real. They are not dreams. Some people say, ah, oh, yeah, these dreams. I oh, know they're not dreams. The ideal is not an abstraction, utopia, or an impossible fantasy, but an integral dimension of human existence, existence civilization. The real is not a universal category beyond our reach. It is not fat fatality. The real is a perpetual, perpetual project. The real, some people say, oh, Lucien, someday you will wake up and you will understand that the real world is not ready for that. I said, the real world is what we are doing. We all shaping the real. The real is not something which is out, it's away from our will or from our capacity to do better. So some examples. So uh, as I said, I'm working quite often in restaurants and uh, with my family and I'm sitting there and uh, discussion and there's olive oil. And I have always my white pastel with me. This is straw paper. And you see, I paint, I do a quick sketch with oil and with my pastel and with my ballpoint. This is an unfinished capriccio also on uh, straw paper. And I, I think I will just leave it unfinished. I like it unfinished. And these are my smaller sketchbooks. Uh, where I use Sharpie. Sharpie, you know, is this big marker. I tried, I, I used, I started using Sharpies to show to my students that you can also do drawings with Sharpies. Sharpies, it's not only to do diagrams, you can also do drawings and you can play around with heavy tools and cheap tools. So this is all cheap square paper, cheap uh, markers. And it's not expensive watercolor paper. Um, this actually is in it's in the book. So I correct it because when I looked at the book, I said, oh my God, I should have done this differently. So I corrected my drawings in the printed book. For some people, I tried to do it in all the books, but I had 600 books and it was taking me too much time. But I did some, uh, some drawings. Uh, this is the Island of the Goddess, is a drawing I did for a friend in uh, Thailand, thinking of her. And this is another of the corrected drawings. One of version, it's like a pink city. So it's the moon, Luna Rosa, which is something I've never seen, but I, there's a very famous Italian song, La Luna Rosa. And uh, my back from Seville, so it's a drawing I did during the summer school, 2016 summer school in Seville. And I didn't really draw any of the buildings. So I did drawings of buildings, but I didn't add any, but I drew this capriccio while I have been in Seville and I finished it with coffee uh, when I was back in Luxembourg. And actually we like looking at this, I let me give you, because I was asked by Simon to give some explanation. So, as you see, my capricci are, they are never perspective, there's never perspective. Uh, it's oblique. So oblique where you show two sides of the building and horizontals remain horizontals, vertical remains vertical. And 
And then I use a technique which was used often by medieval painters. So uh, there's one light side and one shadow side or shade side. There's no projected shadow. And the windows are dark, black or dark. And the shade side is coffee. It's head, so I have lines, horizontal lines and coffee, coffee wash. And, and the coffee is quite an interesting material. It's golden, it becomes really, really golden as a color. The problem is that the coffee will eat the the coffee will destroy the drawing, so it's ephemeral. So uh, after I was warned by the librarian, Notre Dame librarian, that at some point, if I put my sketchbooks in my library, at some point, uh, my sketches, my capriccio will eat all my books because coffee is acid that will destroy all my books. Here's one of, uh, again, a Sharpie, one of uh, Sharpie in a small moleskin. And this is, an, is an, one of my rare day. And I don't know if this is the moon uh, day or whether it's the sun, but you see my ingredients. So it's the loggia, it's the towers, it's the chimney, it's the, it's the pattern of the pavements, and it's the mountains and it's the sea. Uh, my two Mount Fuji uh, stars and moon. On one building in the water, I like to, and this one I really enjoyed working on the texture, on the ornament, giving it some really nice, and as you see, I also use uh, light um, uh, colors, you know, like, um, you can find in medieval Italian painting, Rocky Island. And then uh, one more dramatic, uh, which uh, I used here, I used wax. I put wax on the white side and then I just did the coffee wash and it gets really rainy, gets really a little bit um, sad, you know, a sad night, I would say, it's before midnight. And you can imagine all you like. And this is a full moon capriccio. This is very intense and looks like something important will happen. Also, catapalia table mat with um, this is again with white pastel, gouache, uh, coffee, and choppy. This is another reworked in my book, so I reworked another, it's about, I have several same drawings, but I work them differently with a very burning sky. And this is a drawing, a painting, uh, oil paint on lino, on the lino um, engraving. So I engraved the drawing on lino and linoleum, and then I painted over with, um, and then uh, again, Sharpie, Sharpie and blue uh, markers and pen and blue color with 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 nostal nostalgia from Orient. My dancing buildings. This is also on on, um, on straw paper. And so I started lately to have far more colors and also have more um, intricate pavement peppers. I get more and more interested in patterns and in pavements, which I think is really, really crucial for good public space. And it's so much fun to draw. <clears throat> also, um, abstract ornament. I think abstraction is not a problem. Some people think that abstraction is a problem. It's not a problem. You can see that Art Deco uses abstract motifs and it's really quite wonderful. And abstract motifs also often of always refer to nature. They always kind of, in some ways, symbolize natural forms, natural movements, natural proportions. Waterfront promenades, again, Sharpie, uh, gouache, uh, coffee, mollusk on Moleskin sketchbook. And and I think I'm concluding here every day uh, with a quote by Basho Matsuo, who was a Japanese monk who was mostly spent his life, a nomadic life, mostly traveling around and writing haikus. 
and I and he said every day is a journey and the journey itself is hope. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, Thank I don't you, know Lucian. how much time I spoke. I hope Thank I hope, you. I hope it was uh, can long. you click to exit the slideshow? Uh, okay, yeah, let me let me do that. Let me do that. Let me how do I do that? Uh, okay. Okay, let me let me do that. Okay, so one minute. Uh, not uh, not. Uh, okay, so let me see more. Um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I manage. Uh, to me. Yes, I cut the screen. Thank you very much for the talk. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. If anyone has questions, or I can start asking you a very short question. Why always a full moon? How was the symbolism of the full moon? Um, I think the full moon, I mean, I, I don't think the... I think the moon has many symbolical meanings, but when I do my capriccio, I'm not thinking about mm -hmm. I'm thinking about meanings or symbolisms, and I'm probably more referring to um, like paintings I've seen done by Japanese painters, and also because, and I, and I think also because the moon is really in um, in romantic culture i think it's a romantic it's a it's a kind of maybe symbol of feeling of emotion you know that's the best explanation i can give you but i'm not really giving and i can tell you when i start my painting it's the moon which is organizing the rest i start with the moon really so i start setting up the shore and i placing the moon and that gives me, that gives me in some way the context for the architecture. So it's very important for me. And I think it's like it's probably also, you know, that Norbert Schultz said that architecture was about identity and orientation. And I think the moon to me seems to be very important. I mean, some people it's the sun, but for me it's the moon, a very important element of orientation of us relating to the universe relating to something which is bigger than our little world with problems that's very interesting so practically you consider that each architectural design process should start with a period of um, fantasizing creating a sort of caprice just to fertilize the ideas and have yeah. a more truthful design process? I think that I think that every good architectural process should not only start, but should continue keeping this kind of imaginative process. And I think it's also doing I think that every good project is doing it, even through even through the process of building, you know, when you kind of are ornament or corrections. So there's, because if you, if you, I think one of the, what I see in one of the great problems of modern architecture, it's not the idea of the modern. I think it's the elimination of the, the sensitive, um, and sensual and emotional kind of accompanying of the design process, which you kind of see in uh, in the Capriccio. So I, I wouldn't make a, dif a distinction because then you say, then it's like you know this architect should do say okay I do analysis and then I do the synthesis and then you see I've seen many students in many modern schools you see. Fantastic analysis, great, beautiful, very well done. Then you see a project as a complete detachment. So there's no way you understand how the synthesis 
connects with the analysis because it's a broken process. And Aldo Rossi, Aldo Rossi again, to quote Aldo Rossi, said that the project is analysis and synthesis at the same time. So you cannot just break. There are moments, of course, where you kind of have to step out of a phase and do certain things that look at it differently. And so I, I guess that there are certain moments you you know, you go more in a kind of rational, you have to be in a more rational or let's say more technological, but then I think you should always keep this playfulness of the current show, which I think makes great project. I see, you know, like uh, Max over a monumental project. Uh, I think it's so amazingly playful and rich and it has, it offers so many places and emotions through all the levels of the project. And I think I've seen this also, I see this in, uh, in uh, the work of most of the really good contemporary architects, not only classical. I mean, I've seen, I would say that I've seen this also in some projects by Geary not the one in Al, but uh, Bilbao, definitely you have moments which are kind of quite poetical. You know. Go ahead, Mark. I don't hear you. Uh, yes, I, I'm sorry, I was um, having trouble. You, I was just, you know, hopefully going to write a coherent sentence and then, and then you stopped. Uh, so I, anyway, I'll formulate my question, which is the, the main, I suppose there's many questions I've got, so we, but lots of other people might have questions, so it's not really, we don't want to go on to yes. too many. But I think Please unmute me. your microphone and ask the questions if you have any. Oh, sorry, is, am I, I am. No, you, no, you are, you are talking, the others. Ah, yeah, yeah, yes. Thank so, you. but there was one, I think that stands out for me um, among the various uh, possible questions, and that is the relationship of um, the, your capriccio to design, your design work, because you did mention at some point that there is for you not too much of a difference, or it's all part of a continuum or anyway, a life of a designer, life of the architect. So you have projects, you have drawings, you have fantasies, you have maybe historical research, and you have travels, and you have all these things. And, um, but you don't uh, show any design work and but if say we'd had a lecture by um leon career or aldo rossi who also you know you've several images you've showed then they might have been talking mainly about the graphics the capricci the designs the drawings and so on and then there might have been a building or something or might have been something are you do you um is that what is the reason behind this which could be many you know you maybe feel that you just want to concentrate on the complete sheet for purpose of a lecture or it may be that you don't actually like the buildings you've done or uh, oh you um, mean my buildings yeah sorry you mean buildings i have really built yes no i i don't like the buildings i've built yeah uh, that's what so i i wondered because i know so just, the build, you know because the build no no because Actually, you know, I, I, I left, I stopped practicing. I went into teaching because I didn't really find, I didn't really find, um, I mean, I was very frustrated hmm. by the thing I have been involved with in building. So the buildings are okay, you know, but, uh, but I'm not really... I'm not really getting emotional about it, you know. I, I was disappointed, but I haven't done really that much. I haven't done that much, and I can tell you that the buildings I've done were done under pressure, you know, pressure because uh, the the building materials were were imposed. The so I had very little leverage in some way, but. Uh, I mean, I don't want to excuse only the pressure or the contact. I would also, ex I would also say my, my my lack of experience, and also, also because I mean, I'm writing, and somewhere I wrote that 
I regret now that I accepted to do things which I knew I should not do. I have not done really, I've not done really ugly things. I've not done terrible things. I've not damaged, you know, but I have not, I, I think I could have, I mean, now I only feel, I mean, I feel ready now to go for a new start into a building camp. I gave up on the building career, I can tell you. And so I'm not showing, I'm not showing my, I'm showing projects. I have my design project, I have a lot of design projects. And, yeah, and I, I didn't show all of them because that was a, for time reasons. But I have a, a lot of projects which illustrate, unbuilt projects, which illustrate my capricious strategy. And they were competitions which, uh, where we won, my, myself with Colin Mulherm, we won awards, first, second, third prizes, but we didn't win any realization. And so I'm, these are the projects I really feel um, more attached. A few, I have very few built with projects. I have very, very few. I did social housing, low budget, you know, it's a budget. And I still, I, st I think I can, you know, when I look, I look at it, I, I'm still okay with it because it's very dignified architecture. You know, many people, many people think that it's building which have been there before. So it, they don't look like new buildings and they look, they don't look like social housing. So they look very dignified and they are well inhabited, uh, but they are not, they are not the buildings I would like to spend my life as an architect's building. You know, I'm not really, I'm, I, maybe I'm too ambitious. I don't know. I mean, they were, I, was, I wasn't really getting, yeah. Yes, no, I mean, these are all, I think it's all very good points to sort of understand um, what you're doing. And and um, with, I mean, architecture is a very difficult and strange profession. So you also need a lot of luck. And um, I mean, I, can, I totally identify with your position because I too, the, the buildings I built when I was younger were, mm, you know, something not quite right there or as you said that maybe there's things that you shouldn't have agreed to or there's some change comes in or something stops and they're all a little um you know respectable in in some ways uh just as you're describing although i i think you maybe do yourself down because it seems quite a compliment from most people to say oh i didn't realize that wasn't an older building um or you know, the people don't notice them because they're not shouting at them. They're quiet and you know, respectful, and they're you know people inhabit them and maybe um, don't want to move. And I, I, I think have that's published. one of the, the nicest compliments. Yeah, I have. You know, I have some published, uh, and so it's not that I. It's not that I hide them. You know, it's not that I'm kind of denying them because I have them published. In um, in the mood for architecture. And and also in uh, in other books, you know, I did with Ali Sagachi. So they are all they are all published. Yes, yes. In the, I'll I'll check again. Anyway, that, that was my... the, at least the more important one. Uh, yeah. important one. And as I told you, it's very few. And um, yeah, I think all. I mean, more or less, I published the, the the ones which are publishable. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But I no, think. It's, it's, a Sorry, very important contribution are those alternatives contests yeah. in which you were very involved, showing that you can do it in a different way. Yeah. And Mark also has a project of this similar, something similar in Bath, yeah. showing that practically you can have the same architectural program solved in a traditional way rather than the modernistic yeah. way. And that's why it's like keeping the flame alive. Yeah, that's why I think uh, the counter projects. You know, I'm very, I yeah. mean, I'm very much uh, interested in counter projects, and that's something. Actually, I came, I came actually to traditional architecture through uh, Leon Creer and Maurice Coulot and their counter culture, counter project culture, of the seventies and eighties, because Maurice Coulot, 
the only thing he did, I didn't, I didn't think that he built a single building in Belgium. He did only counter projects. And his building now, he's like in his 80s now, he's now his prosperous period of building in Paris with Disney, which is kind of really strange. But he started building when he was like more past 70. All his work was building, you know, building his thinking, uh, projects, strategies, and offering a number of alternatives, as you said, alternative designs. And, and also I think that what's very interesting for me now, you know, I got really to like teaching a lot because I see that I can work with young people. So I, I mean, I can really design now in team with young people and it's, it's fantastic. It's really very, very fulfilling. You know, I find it more satisfying than sitting in an office and designing for an administration and having the chief city architect censoring every move I do. That's what happened to us. You know, we had everything we did, everything, everything was cut, including our bills, our invoices. You know, we, we had to work for 2% for the Luxembourg government and they have been throwing millions at people like EM Pai and Dominique Perrault. I mean, they were working for 20% 20, 20 of honorariums and we were paid two and two and a half percent. So I, you know, but, uh, but I'm not a bitter person, you know. I mean, I do happy drawings, happy counter -projects. I was very disappointed I didn't get the first prize in uh, Sydney, I must tell you, because uh, I thought uh, the project was so good. Very, very humbly. I think it's very okay. nice when people say they like their projects and they think it's very good. I, I think I think it's it's endearing. So yeah, I'm not arrogant, you know. It's really true. I mean, say sincere. I was waiting to for somebody to tell me you are actually somebody said oh, so actually somebody told me somebody told me you know um, this architect from Ireland from um, he's a member of Tag I think Lab he has an uh, he has an office which is called something Lab Architecture very, and he worked with John Simpson I don't remember his name now yes he said, he said you your project was the best. It probably was, but it doesn't necessarily mean it wins. But this is you know. <clears throat> Connor Lynch. No, it's not Connor Lynch. Okay. Connor Lynch is he Irish? I think he's Scottish. Scottish, I don't know. I think so. Yeah, he's running with his Connor Lynch is the guy who's running with he's running with his Land Rover through Instagram. I think that's yes, Connor Lynch. And visiting classical buildings in Scotland. So, any? But sorry, Georgia, you're the you're the you're the host. Oh yes. Uh, any other questions, Howard? Do you have any questions? He's not having probably his microphone on. Okay, I have some there's some chats. Yes, I'm I've, sure. got a, I've got a quick question um, about, I mean, your compositions are just so beautifully balanced and picturesque. Do you kind of pencil them out or do they just, do they just flow straight out of you in one iteration? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Can you repeat? Yeah. So your, your compositions just seem so beautifully balanced and picturesque. I wondered if you like penciled them out and then made changes before you inked them up or do they just come out of you straight in one hit? Yeah, you know, I refer, I mean, very interesting. So I I refer, I refer, in my book I write actually about that, the way I work. And 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 uh, I had, an, uh, so I, uh, Jaime Correa had an interview with me and I told him, you know, the way my capriccio developed, I do horizontal lines and I do vertical lines then I draw the moon and I draw the sea and then it just develops. And I refer to it, you know, and that's why I am very interested 
in uh, surrealism and situationism, you know, these kind of things which many of my classical colleagues reject because it's the modern period and so on. So because I think it's uh, very helpful. And so I very, I very much like this idea of uh, écriture automatique. Uh, so when you write without really knowing, and I think when you uh, also looking into from Zen culture, I'm very intrigued by this idea of not thinking. Uh, so stopping to think, but going beyond thinking. So in some way, it doesn't mean that you kind of eliminate your mental capacities, but you kind of change the gear and go into a sphere where the mind works in a much broader and, and more connected way. You know, where you have far more neuronal connection that you kind of are a little bit freed of this kind of, uh, you know, maybe obsessions or rationalizations, which kind of don't allow you to kind of evolve. And also, I think that many people, when I talk to people who design, many, very few people can explain exactly how the design comes about rationally. There are always moments where there are jumps and suddenly you, you do something and you don't know where does it come from? And and you can, you know, you can say, ah, maybe I've seen it here, I've seen it there, it's a, it's a precedent here, but sometimes you don't really know. Sometimes it just comes and you find a good solution, a good corner and a good kind of placement that you cannot really explain it. And it's uh, when you write poetry or when, you know, I, I was reading like Murakami the way he writes, I don't know if you were familiar with Murakami's, some people like it, and some people are kind of really obsessed, and I, I, I like it, not always, but I like it a lot. But he, has, he wrote a book uh, on writing. He wrote a book on how he writes, and he says about the same thing, you know, the, the way the novel develops, and he doesn't have a plan, really, and doesn't mean that he doesn't have an idea. It doesn't mean that there's no straight line from the beginning to the end. There's a lot of meandering and there's a lot of bifurcation and there's a lot of flaring. And then afterwards there are corrections. So what I do, I sometimes I come into, I run into a dead end. Suddenly I have something which doesn't work. I have a tower too much or it's not right. And then I kind of do some paste, I paste some gouache and do some corrections. So there's some layering, so there's, but very little actually, I must tell you. It's not that I, it's not that I kind of sketch it out and I think about it. It's really an ongoing free flowing process. And then there's a, what happens sometimes is I do a first draft and then it kind of stays there for two years and then I paint it. And then when I paint it, I make some adjustments. So I paint over it sometimes. It takes, you know, the, often the first draft is quickly done. You know, the, the first one I showed, like, like with the spikes and this, this kind of stranger roof and uh, leaning buildings. It's done very quickly, almost like when you say, okay, you do five minutes of meditation and then you have one minute to draw up something without thinking. That's the way it goes sometimes, but not always. And then afterwards, I kind of process it. So the and idea that, would be not to be afraid to go in this um, crepuscular area yeah, between exactly. dream, thinking, yeah. past and present. Yeah, I think it's avoiding, avoiding to get caught into, you know, that's why I said, it's avoiding you get caught into doctrinaire rigidity, but also not getting caught into provocative, you know, like, because and often architects are a little bit in between, uh, either on one or the other side, you know, they are modernists, they, the only thing they kind of like to do is to provocate and to do crazy stuff, and they don't care for order, for balance, for harmony, for beauty. But sometimes people are so scared to go out of the beaten path that they do things which are very conventional and uh, sometimes a little bit boring, even if they 
even if the it can be boringly beautiful, but sometimes it lacks a little bit of sparkling, you know, you like, and I think I, I'm interested in architecture, which is calm and anonymous, but I'm also interested in moments where you, you know, you, you, where you see a piece of ornament, you see a beautiful piece of furniture, you see a beautiful material. So, I, you know, you, you were mentioning, uh, Mark, you were mentioning the Asplund Library. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and it looks like really, really simple, but it has this incredibly, first thing I think is so small. So the first surprise, it's a really tiny building. And then you have this incredibly uh, powerful simplicity, uh, geometrical, the mass, the massing is so simple, but then inside you have this amazing, amazing interior space. So in terms of volumetry, but also in terms of texture and the books and the stairs and everything. So it's, you want to be, you know, you want to be excited. Yes, I think I think um, that was just right because I was thinking about that building when I when I was in it, and um, it, in a way, I um, I thought I had a, I had a um, assumption to make, and I wanted to test it. And my um, sort of assumption was that a flat ceiling over that distance. You know, it's not when you say it's, it's tiny. I mean, it's not as big as the Pantheon, but it's still quite a big. You know, it takes you a little, little time to walk across it and stuff. It's it's still big enough. And um, I thought, well, a flat ceiling won't be so good. Um, and then actually, it was pretty pretty good. It was pretty uplifting, which is, I suppose, my acid test for a building. Does it does it sort of uplift you ultimately? Um, uh, and so I was rather fascinated and trying to think, well, why is this? And I came to the conclusion that it's because there's no decoration whatsoever. So if the, imagine if there were lines on it or relief or some radial thing, it would sort of tie it down. And then you realize, oh, it's, it's flat. And, you know, if there's a grid on it or, or sort of flat coffering or any, almost anything, you would, you would think, hmm, well, I don't know, it would maybe bear down on you. But because of the sort of height of it and these window and just this sort of basically off white and light, it it, it sort of disappeared. You know, it could be any, anywhere up there, and um, so it's what you know. It's one of those cases I think where this is the the artistry and being an architect or being an artist generally doing something else. Sometimes if you make a particular move, the same move can be done in different ways and. It could have ended up being horrible, but another decision, which is, you know, quite separate about light and painting surfaces, can actually redeem another decision or, or change it or make it. So it's it's a very complex um, sort of operation. And um, one of the things when you're talking about creativity, and I'm very interested to hear about this book by uh, Murakami is that architect, one of the problem about talking about how architects design or how, how, how we work is there's been so much obfuscation and there's been so much myth-making and there's been so much outright, um, well, misrepresentation, almost lying, because I, I, um, well, I think I've probably told this on other occasions. I remember in one of my first tutorial in Cambridge and, you know, or they, the 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 tutor, this very good tutor, wanted uh, and asked me to look at all these sketches and wanted to see the plan. So the plan is the generator, and you know how you show me the plan, and then we can discuss your sketches. And I had sketches, and you know I had sketches and sections and whatever it is, and then oh the plan, what well, it's for down there somewhere. And anyway, it no longer correspond. It didn't. It, it and, and I I just never really believed. I mean, I thought, oh dear, this is a this is a, some sort of strange club because I don't believe that's true. I mean, there will be some architects who literally proceed by generating an elevation from a plan. It's not going to be a very good building, I, I, I suspect. And most people would, to, in order to end up with a building that they actually 
that does the things you wanted to do would have to manipulate the plan so that it produces that three-dimensional thing. So right from the beginning, you have some notions, whether it's form follows function or plan is the generator, that are actually at least significantly wrong-headed or uh, not corresponding to the truth. And so actually I find it, it's really quite rare to have people just sort of talking about how they produce work and certainly not writing it down. I mean, I don't, I don't know if any of you know a good book on architectural design where someone honestly says what they do. I think, I think people would, I think people, would uh, <clears throat> people typically try to pretend that they have a very organized design process. But then when you see, I mean, uh, there's a there's this film on the, the competition in uh, Andorra, the museum in Andorra, which is a recent, there was a film and then you see the competition, there are architects like uh, Jean Nouvel and uh, mm -hmm. Guillaume. And when they, you see them working and then you really understand that they don't know what they are doing. They yeah. just say, yeah, yeah, here, mm, here. Well, wow, here, put the hole here, we'll take this away. I mean, it's just really bricolage. It's bricolage. But they wouldn't admit it. You know, if they admitted it, it, it would be okay. They say, you know, we're just doing, we're improvising. It's just improvisation all the way through. But they would just always try to present their work as a kind of logical, rational, very, very organized thing. And it's, it's definitely not enough. Yeah, yep. but I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. Yeah. Yes, um, no. but I you. think we should wrap it here. Yeah. Lucien, thank you very thank you so much. much. Thank you. It was fascinating. Oh, wow. Yeah, you... And for our two left guests, I would like to mention that the next talk will be by Martina Pacifici from Adam Architecture in uh, Buildings Physics. Oh, and in general in uh, sustainable architecture and the difference between a traditional building and a modern house, how it works. And thank you again for thank this you. very thank interesting so talk. Thank and I so hope much. more students would um, use your process of feeling, drawing and designing in the same time. So there is no demarcation in between those. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, that's why I would like to teach because I think there's a good field where I actually feel myself pretty comfortable. And also, I think also, it, really, that would be my last. I, I think it also corresponds to um, the really most, and I would, I would choose a very dangerous word. I would say it corresponds to the most organic, logical, and human way of learning to learn, you know, by having a lot of fun and using all the capacities, emotional and rational and mental and sensorial, you know, just making it a really holistic, you know, again, it's the, one of these words which is kind of so abused for, but I like to use it, just make it a you know, really holistic thing. And then also uh, this idea, you know, um, we're working with many people, you know, working with craftsmen and working, you know, talking to one another, you know, even the collaborative, you know, talking to colleagues, you know, that's why I like to, you know, I was really happy to meet you and talk to you. And I'm always happy to meet my friends in London and have these conversations. Makes me feel much less lonely in the world. Okay, thank you Enjoy so much. Our Okay. Hi, awesome. thank you. Lucian. Thank you so much again. Yeah, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.